Hi, and welcome to this video where we present scriptgram, which is very similar to continuous bag of words that we just presented in the uh, previous video. So if you haven't watched that one yet, you should do that first before uh, watching the scriptgram video. So the basic idea we were looking at, right, is uh, constructing so-called word embeddings, meaning that we would like to obtain vector representations of words that somehow preserve the similarity between different words, right? So... And we would, this is basically an unsupervised learning task, but we just have a lot of text. And from this, we want to learn these, uh, find these vector representations of words uh, that somehow learn the similarities between the words based on all this training data <clears throat> that we gathered, right? So there's no labels here. We just have a lot of text, right? Here, basically, we like that these similar concepts, apple, banana, oranges, and so forth, would have word uh, vector representations that are kind of similar. Uh, to each other, whereas the tech companies maybe have different types of word embeddings. Okay, so this is the kind of task that we were looking at also in the previous video. We saw the continuous bag of words representation uh, in the previous video. Uh, the basic idea is that we take all this training data that we have, all these uh, all this text, and we turn it into a supervised learning problem where we have labels that we want to learn. <clears throat> the basic idea being that uh, we define a context window around a word, right? So a word here like who, as uh, if we look at the context window of with two around who, it's this window here. And the learning task now that we define for this uh, SIBO, where we want to find these word representations is to predict the middle word from the context around it. So uh, for instance here, right? The If I look at this context window here, the input would be the words partner, broad, can, and accommodate, and then the label that we want to predict in this supervised learning problem is who, right? So, so this is what we saw also in the previous one. The way we represented it was that we said that we're going to do a naive one-hot encoding um, like in bag of words, right? So we just represent every word by a vector with a single one in an, an entry corresponding to that word in the dictionary and zero everywhere else. And so we just represent all the words by standard unit vectors, for instance, the word for has this representation and so forth, right? So there's a standard unit vector for every single word. The number of coordinates is equal to the length of the dictionary, the number of different words that we see, uh, say, throughout all our training data. <clears throat> In the continuous bag of words, we then did the following, right? We trained a shallow neural net where on the one hand side, we feed in the four words in the context window as one hot encoded vectors. Uh, we have a shared weight matrix in some sense between all these uh, four inputs and into the middle layer, which has identity activation. We have another weight matrix here, W prime. <clears throat> and then we have an output layer where we have a softmax activation. And we then we're going to train uh, basically to predict we want the softmax output here to equal uh, the vector that has a single one in the word that was actually the, uh, corresponding to the label. And here we can use the cross entropy loss function to train this and use mini batch to cast a gradient descent. That was the basic idea in continuous bag of words. And <clears throat> the skip gram is very similar to this. So maybe let me just say that this word matrix W here, that or the, the weight matrix W that we have here is the one we use at the end of it to obtain our word embeddings. So this, this matrix here has one row for every word in the dictionary, one column for each and note in the middle layer. <clears throat> and each of those rows will be the different word embeddings for all the words in the dictionary. That's how we, we do it. So we train it. And then once we train this neural net to predict and the middle word from the context window, we can use this weight matrix, use the rows of it as our word embeddings. Okay, so now skip gram is the last method we will present. And it's very similar to continuous bag of words. So we're still looking at a context window around the words in the text. For instance, this context window of width two. And the basic idea now is we're going to kind of flip the learning problem. So the learning task in skip gram is that we want to um, predict the context from the middle word and not the other way around, right? So before in this in the SIBO, right, we predicted the middle word from the context. In skip gram, we're going to uh, compute the con. You could predict the, what the context is from the middle word, <clears throat> right? So it's kind of like the the opposite direction in the learning task, predicting the context from the middle word. So this would mean that in this context window here, the input is who, and the label is this combination of partner, abroad, can, and accommodate. Right, that's the basic idea. And so the way we're going to represent it, we're still going to build a shallow neural net. And the basic intuition is that in the skip gram, we're going to feed in who uh, on the left here in the input layer as a one-hot encoding. Again, a vector with a single one in one of the coordinates. We have the middle layer here. Then we have a weight matrix here, W prime, that is shared. Uh, between the four outputs 
And then uh, we feed in the one hot encodings, we use identity activation. And then in each and every one of these four output chunks, we think of it as there being a softmax activation here so that this is output to vector of probabilities that should indicate the probability of seeing the different words in the dictionary uh, in the output, basically in the context window when the middle word is who, right? So we're gonna basically force the same weights here, the same W prime, so shared weights across these four outputs. <clears throat> That's the basic intuition to have in mind basically to give a similar treatment of all the words in the context uh, around the word, right? They should, in some sense, be treated uh, similarly if the same word appears in different positions. That's that's one intuition here. And what we're going to do is, the idea that we're going to have in mind is that we're going to apply a cross-entropy loss in, on each of these four chunks here. So we're kind of like we'll have a cross-entropy loss here uh, between the word partner, that's one of the outputs here, and whatever the prediction is by this neural net. And we're going to have such a cross-entropy loss for each of these four output chunks. And uh, so trying to force us to predict the correct output, right? So, so we have a cross entropy loss that we try to minimize uh, on the training data that we created from all of our text, right? So, so we wanna use gradient descent in some sense to train this neural net. <clears throat> and then now in this setup, we have, again, we have four cross entropy loss terms, right? On the output, we have one here, 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 and here. So the question is, of course, how do we handle four different losses, right? So this is not something that we've seen before. Um, but the, the basic idea is just to say, well, the final loss of the whole neural net is just the sum of the four cross entropy losses, right? It's a very natural way to define the loss. It's just the sum of the four, right? That might kind of make sense. Now for back propagation, right, what we're gonna do is just, we, we have just a loss function of a value that's being output, right? So we can use back propagation to compute the gradient of this sum of losses with respect to all the weights in the in the network and then just update them and run mini batch stochastic gradient descent just using back propagation right so watch the videos on neural nets just to see the details on on how this is done but it's nothing more than just mini batch stochastic gradient descent on, on a neural net and we just need to define this architecture that we just did okay so <clears throat> the point here is that we have these four losses so let's try to see if we can simplify things a little bit so the idea is that we have four losses. Let's say L1 is the contribution to the loss from the first part, L2 here, L3 here, and L4. Uh, the final loss, as we just said, was the sum of these losses, like L1 plus L2 plus L3 plus L4. And now what we're gonna do with back propagation is that we're gonna compute the gradient of the loss function with respect to the input parameters, W, uh, the parameters of the network, right? W and W prime. Those were the two weight matrices in the network. And as soon as I have something that's linear here, we know uh, by rules for computing gradients that uh, the final gradient is just the sum of the gradients, right? So you compute the, you can compute the gradient for the first loss with respect to W and W prime with the second loss with respect to W and W prime and so forth. And then what gradient descent would do would be to take a small step in the negative direction of the gradient. So we would update the pair of weight matrices by subtracting a small step size eta times this gradient that we just computed here uh, for the loss. Okay. Now <clears throat> we can try and simplify this a little bit. And this is something that is actually done in the skip gram representation. This current way we formulated is mostly for intuition on what's going on, uh, but let's try and simplify things a little bit. Uh, so the intuition being that if I only take a small step in the negative direction of the gradient uh, in each round of gradient descent, then the intuition is that the gradient uh, of my loss function doesn't change by much, basically because my input parameters didn't change by much. Okay, so, so the idea here is that we're gonna, instead of doing it like this, that we have four losses, we sum them up, we compute uh, the gradient for each and every one of them, and, and that gives our final gradient vector. What we can do is let's try to see what happens if we handle the losses one at a time, like L1, L2, L3, and L4. So let's say we compute the gradient of the loss uh, the ith loss function with respect to w and w prime. And we take a small step in the negative direction of the gradient before we move on to uh, loss i plus one. So meaning that basically we're taking a small step in between each and every one of these four gradient computations. So if we do like that, right, so we do them one at a time, then what we will start out by doing is looking at the first loss. So then we will compute, we have W and W prime, we we'll compute the gradient of this uh, with respect to these parameters for the first loss function, take a small step in the negative direction, the gradient, which would give us some new uh, weights, weight matrices, W1 and W1 prime. So let's call them, this is the new ones that result from taking the first small gradient step. 
Now, if we do gradient descent, right, then what would happen in the next step is that we would, uh, if we already took a small step, what we'll do now is that our new weight matrices are actually at W1 and W1 prime. So what we'll be computing gradients, we're basically computing them here at W1 and W1 prime <coughs> for the second loss function. And so we'll be evaluating it at W1 and W1 prime and taking a small step away from W1 and W1 prime, which gives us W2 and W2 prime. And then again, we start there, a computer gradient for L3 and so forth, right? So we kind of just <clears throat> replacing the one step in the top here by four small steps. And the next steps, the important point is they do depend on the previous steps. Now, <clears throat> the point is that, well, if the gradients change very little after a step of gradient descent, right? So you change the parameters a little bit, so maybe the gradient changes even less, then Basically, what this means is that this gradient here is basically the same as the one you had in, as if we took with respect to W and W prime, right? Because, well, if the gradients don't change much, it's basically the same. So which means we say, okay, maybe W2 and W2 prime are roughly the same as W1, W1 prime minus a, the gradient with respect to the original parameters. And then again here, right, uh, if the steps are small, we could also say the same here. It's basically the same as if we looked at the original parameters. And down here as also if we kind of looked at the original parameters, right? So, so basically we get this, this is roughly what happens if the gradients don't change by much, then doing the steps one at a time, four steps is basically the same as doing one big step. Right? That's the kind of intuition. And so <clears throat> if we look at it and see what's happening here, W4, W4 prime, you can write it as roughly the same as uh, W3, W3 prime minus this fourth eta. Then you can unfold W3, W3 prime until W2, W2 prime minus the step size. And then you unfold the, the W2s, unfold the W1s, and we get down to the original one. So if we do this, what we see is that W4, W4 prime is roughly the same as if we do W, W prime uh, minus a small step in the negative direction of the sum over all four gradients with respect to the original uh, input parameters, all four loss functions with respect to the original input parameters. And this is just the, the real, the, the loss function that we started out, right? The gradient is like the sum of these uh, gradients is the gradient of the sum. Right? That's what we started out by saying. So basically what's happening here is <clears throat> that what we just argued is that even though if I take four small steps after doing one great step for one of the four output losses, I do the next for the next output loss and so forth, these gradients are almost the same steps as, as I would have done if I had looked at all the sum of all four losses and computed the gradient. Okay, so, so the point here is that, well, gradient descent is roughly the same if we handle the four losses one at a time. Okay, so why is this useful or what can we use this for? What's the intuition? Intuition is we would like to, uh, what we use for is to simplify this network a little bit, right? So this is a little bit annoying with four outputs. So to simplify it for gradient descent, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna have one target instead. Uh, so we're just gonna try to predict one word instead of four in this case, uh, but we're gonna replace this one training example by four training examples. So what we're gonna do is just, we're gonna replace this whole context window that we're trying to predict with four samples, one where the input is who, we have to predict partner, who, uh, predict abroad, who, predict can, who, predict accommodate. So we just feed in all four of them. Right, so that's the, the basic idea. So this is a much simpler neural net right now. There's only one output. There's only the W prime. Well, it was shared before anyway, so it's the same setup. And now we just have one pair here, who and partner, and we have to predict partner from who. Right, so so that's the new skip gram. That's actually the final skip gram architecture here. So we, we feed in, uh, the middle word here on the left as a one hot encoded. We have a, uh, a matrix W of weights here. We have the middle layer here with identity activation. We have an output matrix here between the output layer and the hidden layer. And we use softmax activation here in a cross entropy loss against uh, the label, which is one of the words in the context window. Right. So, so it's very similar and uh, to continuous bag of words, but here we're just predicting the context from the middle word, and we're just going to generate four training examples uh, for every placement of the context window. Right, so we're going to create who and partner, who abroad, who can, and who accommodate. All these four examples are being added to uh, to the output or to the training data for the uh, training this uh, supervised learning model. Right, so so that's creates uh, four four training examples instead of just one. Okay. So, so that's the, the, the skip gram here, predict the 
context from the middle word, and we're just going to train it like this with cross entropy loss. In SIBO, we're predicting the middle word from the context, right? So here the input is going to be the sum of four feature vectors instead. And we're trying to predict the one word in the middle. Up here, we have four training examples where from the middle word, we're predicting each and every one of the uh, surrounding examples, right? So two slightly different things, but pretty similar uh, after all. So now in both of these two representations, both the skip gram and the continuous spec words, uh, the way we obtain a words embedding once we've done training this neural net is the same, right? So we just basically we just look at what's the output of the middle layer here. And that's obtained by taking a, the word, taking the corresponding one hot encoding and multiplying W, right? So that's basically extracting the teeth row of W. So each of the rows gives each of the embeddings of each of the, the words in the dictionary. So this would look like this, right? So the, the W here at the end of it, we just have a row for every word in the dictionary giving uh, the word embedding of it. And the number of columns here is equal to the number of hidden uh, neurons here. So maybe you choose this as a couple of hundred or something. So, so th those are the two different alternatives. And it seems in practice, uh, if you don't have that much data, then continuous bag of words seem to work best. Maybe because I guess you get a little, it's a little easier learning task. You have four, I guess a little bit more information in the input to, to on one of the training samples. So maybe it's a little bit uh, simpler of a task. If you have lots of data then mm -hmm. Skipgram tends to, to work best. Uh, maybe you have four times the amount of training data, but it's a harder learning task. So, so those are the two, you know, trade-offs. If you don't have that much data, typically continuous bag of words work best. If you have lots of data, Skipgram tends to work best here. Now, maybe some, just a few applications of such word embeddings. <clears throat> you could, for instance, uh, in addition to representing documents, uh, you could also use a measure similarity between words based on inner products of their embeddings, right? So if things have large inner products, they're very similar. If they have small inner products, they're very dissimilar. Um, so that's a similarity measure of words. You could also try and say, find the odd one out. So let's say I give you a list of four words, breakfast, cereal, dinner, and lunch then you can ask which one of these words doesn't match the others. In this case, right, serial is the kind of one that's different from the three others. I see. The others are, I guess, this is a type of food and the others are, I guess, a, a meal. Uh, so the basic point here is the way that you can solve it once you have these word embeddings is that you can look at all these four words, they have a word embedding, or, which is a vector or a point. And that point or vector, um, the one of them that's the furthest away from the others is the odd one out, right? So the, the word embedding that lies furthest away from the rest of the vectors has the largest distance to them could be defined as the, the odd one out. So that's something that you can actually, if you use like well-trained uh, models based on Skipgram and SIBO, this will work very well. You can also do word arithmetic in some sense. This is also one of the interesting properties about the Skipgram and continuous bag of words. If they're trained on a lot of data, things like this will actually work. So you can take the embedding of the word king, it gives a vector. You can subtract off the embedding of the word man and add the embedding of the word woman. And then you would actually get roughly the embedding of the word queen, which is very surprising. And, and basically what, what do we mean by roughly? Basically, what we do is we can subtract, compute these vectors, king minus the embedding of man plus the embedding of woman, and then find what is the closest vector to this among all the vectors that represent words. And actually, the closest one in this exam turns out to be queen. Uh, so, so this is actually a really surprising thing that you can, you can actually do with these word embeddings. <clears throat> and finally, if you want to use these word embeddings for uh, text classification, then you want one approach to, if you want a whole document to be represented as a vector, typically you can maybe sum or average the embeddings of the words that occur in the document, right? So, so that is still a better representation than uh, just a naive bag of words and so forth, right? Just a final uh, few points about pre-trained models. So you can actually find really large pre-trained models. So Google, for instance, has released pre-trained models that has been trained on really, really large data sets. Like so, just a file with all the embeddings of all the words in this data set is like a more than a gigabyte. And so you can find these, so you don't have to train them yourself. Uh, oftentimes, when you talk about Skipgram and continuous bag of words, they are often just are referred to together as word to vec, and then so those two together is just typically named word to vec if you come and stumble upon that uh, terminology. And finally, uh, maybe one uh, point more here is that this is library fast text. It's a super efficient and free implementation of Skipgram and continuous bag of words, where you can also load 
pre-trained models into this uh, fast text. So those are just a few pointers uh, to something that uh, tools and stuff that might be uh, relevant for you if you want to work with text data.